and basically the idea is how to find the will of God. As we're all observing Pope Francis, I think Pope Francis doesn't appreciate Jesuit moral theology, but he respects the Ignatian method of discernment, of finding the will of God. But when the discernment of the divine inspirations is incorrect, inattentive, then what happens then is an easy attribution of divine origin to any idea that comes to the mind or to any emotion that is felt. In some religious communities, what comes to the mind to the superior is immediately said to be the divine will, and then there is no mercy. You have to follow it. This can easily become abusive. In our Dominican Thomistic tradition, we speak about the new law, the gospel, which envelops both nature and therefore the natural law. And the new law is composed of two elements, both of which are important and have to function simultaneously. The grace of the Holy Spirit, which is given to those who believe in Christ, and the teaching transmitted in word and writing, which has the dual function of leading to the grace of the Holy Spirit and ordering the use of grace. The teaching transmitted in the church, beginning with the text of the Gospels, is not a temporary scaffolding that may be dismissed once the building is built. It will no longer be necessary in heaven, but so long as we live on earth, we need a corrective text which saves us from an arbitrary attribution to God of every emotion or brainwave. But of course, the words that are transmitted without a concomitant faith in Christ and openness to the inner grace of the Holy Spirit will be frustrating and ineffective. The Thomistic synthesis doesn't deny the importance of discerning the promptings of grace, but they have to be assessed with the help of objective teaching, of objective standards, and only then they are to be implemented. It's the virtues that manifest the life of the Spirit, not just the inspirations. This teaching of Aquinas is based upon St. Paul. In Romans, Paul says, those are the children of God who are led by the Spirit. So what is decisive is a childlike openness to the promptings of the Spirit and a real response. And this has to be maintained in all dimensions of life, including moments when we make important decisions. Now, the moral theology of the modern centuries has been distorted by the heritage of 14th century nominalism. The Belgian Dominican father, Serve Pinkers, who was a professor in Fribourg, has magnificently explained this phenomenon, and his works are being translated into all the major languages and have an, and the, he has shown the way for the renewal of moral theology. Now, in the 14th century, there was a change in the understanding of the nature of the will and therefore of moral agency. And this heritage is present in modern minds. And so we have to keep clear of this generally unconscious distortions as we try to read Aquinas. And then we find that his moral synthesis is liberating. In the modern understanding, the will is said to be absolutely free. We have the modern expression, free will. The will is with an adjective attached, free will. And it is said to be in a similar but rival position in the face of an absolutely free will of God. As a result, God being more powerful, imposes his will that becomes an obligation. And our conscience, is to read off that the will of God and in rubber stamp fashion apply it to the act. Thus obedience has become the general virtue. And in the modern centuries moral teaching was centered upon the moral law understood as a list of obligations presented in the imperative with the, decal with the decalogue read in the imperative rather than the Sermon on the Mount and the New Testament. And then individual acts with casuistry, which had to put into practice the obligation which was imposed by God. 
and this was separated from spirituality, which was treated as a distinct optional theological discipline reserved for, the, for an elite. This view has been criticized by theologians for more than the last half century, but nevertheless, it is still in the spontaneous thinking of many. Aquinas' vision of moral theology is different. It's primarily about God. And Aquinas says there are three modes of being of God. First of all, God is everywhere, in all creative reality. So also in the metal or the wood out of which a tabernacle has been made. Then in a different way, God is present by grace in the soul of the per person who's praying in front of the tabernacle. And in a different way, God is present in the hypostatic union in Christ, in the Blessed Sacrament, who is inhabiting the tabernacle. And this threefold division corresponds to the division of the Summa theology. This means that the second part is about the fruitfulness of grace within the acting person. The Secunda Pars of the Summa presents the plenitude of grace in the in divinely transformed person. Aquinas doesn't use the term free will, libera voluntas. Instead, he uses the term liberum arbitrium, the free choice, which entails the joint action of the reason and the will. Now, in the 13th century, the Franciscans understood Aquinas as saying that he supposedly he presented an intellectual vision. It's enough for you to know so as to act. Well, this is obviously wrong. So the Franciscans proposed a voluntarist understanding. The will is decisive. In the modern centuries, there was a sequential understanding of the relationship of the reason and the will. The reason, the conscience, which is an act of the reason, knows, and the, the will then obe obeys. So ultimately, again, the will is decisive. If it disobeys, it has to be forced. This has led to a rigid, Pelagian, neurotic approach to moral agency. Now, we may say that this is a fine speculative point, but the way how we define liberty and the functioning of the will conditions our understanding of life. Now, according to Aquinas, the liberum arbitrium entails the joint action of reason and the will, and they mutually influence one another. Thus, free action is creative. It has to go for the verum bonum, the true good, but in a creative way. And consistency in this contributes to the growth of liberty. Liberty is not an innate given. It's not that we are born free. Liberty may grow or it may decrease. In essence, it is creative as it responds to moral challenges. I've given you this list where I've presented liberty according to Aquinas, defined as the liberty of quality in which we grow, and the modern understanding deriving from nominalism, the liberty of indifference, and how they influence our understanding of moral agency and the whole of moral theology. You can look at this later. Thus, in the Thomistic approach, not norms, but the virtues are in the center. And they are initially infused by grace. And first, the theological virtues establish a contact with God. And as a result, the moral virtues are generated. So faith is first, because it ensures a contact with God and triggers the supernatural life. When faith is exercised in prayer, it's followed by hope that focuses the will on the divine mystery as it unfolds itself in life and by charity that enables one to befriend God and others in view of God. And then the theological virtues provoke the moral virtues. Even though the moral virtues are infused by grace, they need to be cultivated and they enable quick, easy, pleasurable and creative, personally responsible action for the true good. Now many people never cross the threshold of virtue. 
They do good things when they're forced to do. They try to avoid sins, but they are never creative in action. Truly virtuous people are unpredictable, precisely because they are creative. They see challenges and respond to them. So in Aquinas' view, prudence, which I translate as the virtue of creative resourcefulness is in the center and not conscience. In the Summa there's no treatise on the conscience, whereas in modern moral theology the conscience was in the center. Prudence forms the reason and the will in the creative going for the recognized good. Now, if you turn the sheet that I gave you on the other side, on the top we have the modern traditional interpretation which puts the functioning of the reason and the will, the mind and the will, in sequential fashion. This is given in all the manuals of, of, of neo-Thomism and it's absolutely useless, it doesn't fit our experience of life. Whereas there is a new interpretation based on the presupposition that the heritage of nominalism has to be removed. And it's much simpler. And as you see here, there are basically three or four stages. Intention, decision, and execution. And sometimes when there is a problem between the intention and the decision, there is deliberation. Now, the functioning of the mind and the reason in each one of these boxes is not sequential, one after the other but there is a joint action of the cognitive and the appetitive faculties, which means that there is creativity in each one of these three or four stages. Now, the conscience precedes this move. The conscience sees the challenge, and then there is the intention, decision, execution, and then afterwards the conscience may look back and judge what I have done. Now, there has to be creative reflection in each one of these stages because the truth has to come in in every stage and it has to be perceived personally and creatively. And the moral law is brought in only at the stage of the deliberation if there is doubt. And evil possibilities have to be excluded. But the reference to the moral law is not necessary in every situation because many acts are obvious. In many most decisions that we, many of our actions, there's no deliberation. There's no problem. We move directly from intention, decision to execution. Now, prudence, the virtue of creative resourcefulness, is the cardinal virtue that gets you through the entire process. That's why Aquinas focuses more on prudence than on the, on, uh, con the conscience. And prudence is not just caution is the capacity to be creative. So on the level of the intention, we have to have dreams. If you don't have dreams, we need to stimulate them in some sense to have a vision, to have an idea about life. Now, some people have no ideas, no intentions. You give them a project and they do it. Other people have plenty of ideas, but they can't choose. Then the decision. Some people fail to make decisions. And we are seeing this today in life, that many men do not want to decide about marriage. They're going, they have a girlfriend for 10 years, but they can't decide about marriage. Because they're incapable of moving from intention to decision, they're constantly deliberating. And some people are good in intention and decision, but when they arrive at the execution, they're lazy. This is my problem, <laughs> to, get, <laughs> to get the thing done. So various people have various difficulties. And in formation, it's good to see where the person has the difficulty and to help to move forward and to be creative in these stages. Does God come into the picture? Where? God comes in every stage if he is invited. We may invite God or we may ignore God. And God is like an old man with a, sitting on a bench in the park smoking his pipe. And we are running from intention, decision to execution. And he's wondering whether we'll stop for a moment and ask for his advice at whatever stage we are going. Sometimes we ignore him because we're so busy going towards the execution. 
When the person has the ability of passing from intention to execution, then the theological virtues, as they cultivated in prayer, may flower in the moral virtues. So, first of all, we have to focus on the theological virtues, establish a contact with God, not asceticism first and mysticism at some advanced stage, but asceticism has to be mystical. At the beginning, it's more important to focus upon God, believing in the supernatural power of faith that establishes the contact with God and triggers the supernatural life. Then, in the context of the personal relationship with the living God, then make practical decisions. God doesn't take away our liberty, but the living relationship with God enhances our personal liberty. God, the first cause, is not one cause among many others. The cause is first, not in the temporal sense, but in the metaphysical, meaning that everything depends upon God. So the first cause can act within the second cause in such a way that the second cause loses nothing of its dignity as it is moved by the first cause. Since, since God has created the human will, God can work within our human will, which is not then reduced to the level of a de dead puppet on strings in the hands of God. So it's not a question of either or, either God or man. And so our act may be 100% supernatural and 100% natural at the same time. God works through human liberty. And the Thomistic perspective given in the Secunda Pars shows the supreme perspective of the believing person transformed by God. But it doesn't show the process of spiritual growth. It views the summit of the grace transformation of the person. That is why the teaching of Aquinas at times seems to be distant, theoretical, and not experiential. The Carmelite tradition tries to speak about the stages of growth, which entails purifications, the nights of the senses of the spirit. But even the Carmelite tradition doesn't give an exact road map. It shows the perspective and insists that there is movement. But we go through in life as the birds flying in the air. At the crossroads, sometimes we have to check and see where we're going. But basically, we decide. And if we've gone astray, God, like a GPS, doesn't immediately punish, but he leads us on from where we are. But we need to be personal and authentic in the response. Now, how do we apply all this to the stages of a Dominican vocation. The prime responsibility for formation is of the individual. Formators, priors, provincials, regions of studies contribute, but they do not take away the individual's responsibility. And we cannot complain that our formators were limited because ultimately we are responsible for our vocation and life. Now the admission to the order, to profession, to ordination, all this can be viewed from the side of the individual, making the decision and entering the order, and from the side of the superiors who listen to the voice of others, but then ultimately make personal decisions about the reception of a brother. In this process, the superiors also have to invite the Holy Spirit's assistance as they finally make the decision about the brother. But the vocation is perceived individually but it is confirmed or not by the church through the superiors. So the vocation is not uniquely subjective. Somebody may claim that I have a Dominican vocation and yet he's not accepted in the order. And what is our vocation? What was the most important moment of our life? This is something that we shall discover at the moment of death. Then we will know what was the most important moment. But how do the superiors know whether to receive a brother? How do they arrive at a decision? Well, there is a procedure prescribed by the constitutions, the voting of the chapter and the house council. But often the members of the chapter and the council know little about the individual. Sometimes they follow the view of the formator. 
the provincial may also have further information and he may refuse somebody who had been voted positively, positively by the chapter and the council. When I was appointed the student master in Krakow in Poland, this was a different social political moment, there were 116 brothers in the student data. At chapters, when they were voted on, slides had to be shown on the wall because the fathers in the community didn't know the brothers. Less than half of those brothers reached ordination and quite a few have left the priesthood afterwards, but some of them are still here. <laughs> now, we, uh, I remember when we had a visitation of Father Damien Byrne and the student brothers asked about the individual spiritual direction. In diocesan seminaries, there is the Jesuit tradition that every seminarian has a spiritual director whom, with whom he meets regularly. Well, in our tradition, the student master is not the confessor of the brothers. And so the brothers asked Father Damien, why don't we have this practice? Now, I remember way back, Father Jordan Alman at, at the Angelicum explained that spiritual direction entails the pulling of a man apart and then putting him back together as a Jesuit. And sometimes the first stage works and the second doesn't. Now, of course, some people are so complex that they need help in sorting themselves out. But the answer that Father Damien Byrne gave was, instead, we Dominicans have two formative moments, a demanding community life and a great theological synthesis. Now, if our community life is not demanding, and if effort to grow in the theological synthesis is lacking, then we crash. And this is very true. So we have a demanding community life. We have a system of chapters in government. We debate issues. We have convictions. We thrash them out. We elect our superiors. And then we implement what has been decided in the community. We are expected to add our own gift of self into the common project. This system requires maturity and convictions. It requires the capacity to listen to others. It requires honesty and the willingness to engage in a fraternal debate. But when the chapters are fictitious, when real issues are evaded and never discussed, and when powerful personalities block others, then the system doesn't work. Various countries and cultures have their local traditions which influence the way the province functions. Is the province a gentleman's club, like in England? Is it a political party and the winners take control of everything? Is it like in Africa sometimes the tribal origin is most important? Each province needs to perceive what is the typical blockage that prevents the flowering of personal maturity. And it needs to work to ensure that our Dominican government is not only effective, but also life-giving. I've learned, living next to Father Carlos Aspiros Costa, that the art of government consists in arranging things in such a way that each individual may give the best of himself. Not all people have the same possibilities, but the community should help in the maturing of each individual. And as a procurator general, Carlos often said that the procedures are set, set to help the person who has landed in a mess so that he may live the rest of his life responsibly and with some happiness. And so sometimes he has to leave the order, but it's a process to help him. Father Victor Hofstetter, who was the provincial of Switzerland, he would say that assignments are not just for the plugging of holes. We need to note that somebody has matured for a change. And in this, the brethren have a role. And they can explain this to the individual and to the provincial. The region of studies, who is appointed by the master of the order, should intervene with the provincial so as to ensure that the brother, who has the capacity to go on for further studies, to give him the possibility and the one who is wasting his time be pulled out from advanced studies and sent to other work. 
sometimes those who could study do not write doctorates, do not write books, because immediately bec they become formatus prior syndics. And those who do not have the talents for such tasks are not allowed to study. So, I'm sorry, and those who do not have the talents for such tasks, they are allowed to study, but little comes out of their studies. In the past, there used to be chapters of faults, which were remembered in a caricature form. But there was a profound concern in this practice, but a new way has to be found in filling in this need. Community life with daily house tasks is a place of observation where individuals are seen in action. In the small community, it is easier to see how a brother functions. As we brush against one another, there is room for fraternal correction. But often the brethren are indifferent towards one another. And so the community doesn't contribute to the forming of an individual. A demanding community life in which the brother is seen has greater value than psychological tests. And this is the ancient wisdom of the order. That is why there is voting for the admission to profession and ordination. And then we need the great theological synthesis. As we enter the order, we do not know the order's theological tradition. And the intellectual formation should lead to the acquisition of a theological synthesis. Studies are not primarily in view of, of a practical pastoral function, nor for the acquisition of a specialized knowledge that may offer a paid job, but they are to lead to the intellectual acquisition of an articulation of faith that nourishes, strengthens, and defends faith against contrary winds. Theological study is not just to satisfy some intellectual abstract curiosity. It is to help in the spiritual life, supporting with structures of the mind formed within faith. We need not only experiences, examples, and feelings. It's not enough to be merely moved. We need to have convictions in the face of the omnipresent confusion. And so the mind needs clarity. At present in the church, we're observing a dislike of speculative theology. But how long can you dialogue if you have no clear ideas in your head? And very soon in the church, there will be a loud calling for speculative theology that allows one to have clear convictions. And I think as an order, we have to prepare an army of intellectuals who can clearly articulate the basic philosophical and theological truths. And it is not only during the initial stage of formation that a theological synthesis has to be worked out. Throughout life, the engagement with God has to be the subject matter of thinking and deeper clarification. Now, there are some problems that are not perceived in the initial stage. You need to have some experience of life and its problems to see the value of canon law. And the same applies for theology. You need to engage with God, struggle with your own life, understand the problem that peoples have, and deepen your own response to God to see the value of dogmatic and moral theology. And so a student brother sometimes complains that he doesn't feel what he is being taught. Of course, grace, virtues, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the sacrificial value of the redemption, the sacraments, advanced prayer, all this is not felt. But theological studies offer the categories that articulate this reality. Now, if a brother doesn't continue the study of, of a theology that nourishes his spiritual life after the initial formation, then when problems appear, he searches for psychological therapy, or gets involved in politics, or finds some other escapes that become idols for him, and then his Dominican life crashes. And even if he acquires some specific professional competence in a given field, in finances or biblical archaeology, he still needs to nourish his life of faith by prayer, the sacraments, the word of God, and a theology that puts all this together and that's why the intellectual formation should lead. I remember Cardinal Schoenborn, he wasn't yet a cardinal, he visited us and he said this, that the formation should lead to the stage when a brother holds on to a great theological master, confirmed by the church, 
This may be Aquinas, Augustine, John of the Cross, John Paul II, Ratzinger. And if he spends the first 10 years after ordination, reading everything that he can find in the Master, forming his preaching and teaching in the theology of the Master, then he will not get lost. If he has no Master, he will preach about what was in the news yesterday, or he will constantly talk about himself and not about God. Now, what are we to observe in a brava while discerning his vocation? The most important question is, is he interested in God? Does he have a supernatural motivation? Now, the candidate to the order, <laughs> or the brother before profession, may still have a difficulty in articulating precisely his motivation. But the superior who accepts him has to be clear that he is in the order for God. Then there is hope that he will cling to God and develop his understanding of his relationship with God as life proceeds. If he's in the order because he doesn't know what to do with his life uh, in a difficult social situation, or because he's immature and wants somebody else to decide for him, that is not enough. He has to be concerned about his relationship with God. I had a brother in the student aid who at times was difficult, having an abrasive temperament, but I saw that his Bible was well read and annotated. This was a sign for me that he was concerned about God, and he was generous in his own way. He is in the order. The second moment, the brother has to have a human maturity appropriate to his stage of life. He won't have the wisdom of a 50-year-old, but he has to have psychic balance. Father Alexander Hauke-Ligoski, who was the student master when I was the assistant student master, he, he would say that man has the nature of a hunter and not of a hunted animal. We need to go forward in life. If somebody is constantly escaping, he will finally escape from religious life and then escape from one wife to another until he finds a mother-in-law who will decide for him. If he perceives that the Dominican life is not for him and he has some new project in life, all well and good, go. He should leave and do what he perceives as important. A brother may have some moral psychic difficulties, nobody's ideal, but if he's moving towards God, credo in Deum, he's on the way. Sanctity does not consist in psychic ease or in moral perfection. It consists in the meeting of human frailty with the power of God. So if he holds on to God in his youthful way, he's going forward. And what is important is generosity, the willingness to do something good freely. If he's only obedient, but lazy and boring, he's not growing in virtue. But if a brother has serious psychological problems, addictions, pedophilia, he's gay, he should be dismissed. Father Damien Bird said, do not burn said, do not save the province by receiving inappropriate people, because then all the energy will go into the dealing with the problems that they cause, instead of preaching the gospel. Deliberation should not be too lengthy. Before the code of 1917, there was no temporary profession. The first profession was already perpetual. This was similar to engaged couples. They're engaged, after a short period, they marry and it's for life. In the past, the active voice was not tied with the solemn profession, but with a number of years having passed since the profession. So decisions about remaining for life in the order were made very early. Now the church has imposed a time of temporary profession, but it should not be extended too long. The time before the solemn profession extends the deliberation and often makes the decision difficult. That is transferred. In the past, what was remembered was the moment of vestition. In our old priories, we have pictures of a man who leaves his lay clothings and he receives the habit. This was decided. Now the decision sometimes is moved at the moment of solemn profession and ordination, which means that they're left hanging in, in insecurity, which is not good. And some sisters are even worse. They have a, an even longer process, which is unfair for women. 
I've known old men in the order who entered in the, when the memory of the pre-1970 code was still alive. They entered in their teens, had a short temporary profession, they were ordained in their early 20s, and their entire class died in the order. If there is a pre-novitiate, it should not be in the form of an extended novitiate, but should be lived out from the position of a layperson. This is what Father Damien Byrne also suggested. If the order is slow in deciding about a candidate, he's then confused and unsure. When adults are treated in an immature way, then they become immature. So be a child before God and an adult in the face of life and not the reverse. Even though there are frailties, trust in God, base yourself on the mystery of faith and be mature and responsible in life. Otherwise, there is Pelagianism in the face of God and permanent adolescence in the face of life. Amen. Thank you.